Trooper Steve Cheney, Bobby Cromer, Gary Scott, Pat Raider, Liza Argenbright, Rick and Kim Hickey, Bonnie Kirby, Donnie McFerrin, Maddie Wheat, Jeannie West, Chuck Hunt, Fred McClure, Charles Bowman, Logan Mullins, Janice Adams, Brandy Lear, uh, Brandy Meese, Juanita and Coleman Dedrich, James and Peach Boone, Ron Argenbright, Glenna Smith, Joyce McComb, Jean Botkins, Shirley Brown, and the family of Teresa Joel Turner, and the family of Jenna Barron. So uh, let's remember those in our prayers. <coughs> 322. On a hill.
reading this morning will come from uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 3. Uh, what a beautiful Lord's Day morning. Uh, certainly I'm happy to see everyone here this morning. Uh, if you are a visitor with us, we want you to know that we are very happy to have you. We'd love to have you anytime you come back. Uh, there's no better place we could be than right here this morning. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Without any mistakes on my part, that was the reading from uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. We now have a great honor and privilege to go to the Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. Let us pray. To the great, wonderful, and almighty Heavenly Father, we're so humbled and thankful to be able to start another new week out in your great and glorious home, Father God. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here with like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ and for each and every person here. Father God, we're so anxious and, and ready to sing songs of praise and hear words of worship and send prayers to you, Father God. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the blessings that we have in our life, our homes, our places of stay, the material blessings that you bestow upon us and allow us to achieve and receive. Heavenly Father, for the natural blessings, the rain, the sunshine, the fruitful seasons, the crops that grow, the animals about the earth, they go to the sustenance and nourishment of our bodies, Father God. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the speaking, preaching, and teaching brethren that they deliver your word in spirit and in truth under our hearing so that we may use it into our daily lives and be better and more faithful soldiers unto you. Father God, we're thankful for Brother Ovi who prepares to stand before us this morning to deliver your message. We pray that the lesson that he's taught is good unto our hearing and that it is good unto you, Father God, and that he has the strength and courage to deliver your message just as he's prepared straight from your word as we know and have faith that he will do, Father God. Heavenly Father, we're thankful and thank you for the health care workers who continue to battle and fight through this great pandemic that is afflicting our earth. Father God, we pray that you give them the strength and courage to, continu to continue to fight on and let them know that we are so thankful for their, for their fight and their diligence to continue, Father God. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you be with them and keep them safe and pre preserve them and pre preserve their health as healers on this land, Father God. For Heavenly Father, with this great pandemic, as we fight so diligently and it caused division in our lives and in our world. But Father God, we know with the snap of your fingers or the twinkling in your eye that this pandemic could be lifted and our lives would return to normal, Father God. For we know that you are the great healer, both mentally, physically, and spiritually, Father God. Heavenly Father, the prayer list this morning and over the last few weeks has become very lengthy. There's been many names written on there, many of loved ones and friends of the congregation here. Father God, we ask that you reach down your, white, your healing hand and heal them and restore at least a portion of their health if it be your will. For those who are standing over freshly dug and open graves, we pray that you be with their loved ones who, who stand to mourn. We pray that you give them strength and comfort as only you can, Father God, and that they turn to you and allow you into their lives and into their hearts for that healing, Father God. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to live in a country where we aren't restricted uh, in our ability to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray for the President of the United States down to the lowliest of magistrates or the lowliest of elected officials that there would never be any laws enacted that would hinder us from being able to do so or worship you, Father God. Heavenly Father, your name and teaching has been under attack, under attack all over the lands, all over the world. And we pray as faithful Christians we would never give up the faith. We would never deny you and that we would always be steadfast and strong in proclaiming that Jesus Christ is the true and living Son of the Almighty God, Father God. Heavenly Father, for those who are here today in this congregation, 
who, who may be outside the realm of safety, who may, ha who may not have made that great confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Father God, we pray that they have the courage to make that walk this morning, to come down and say Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be buried in the watery grave of baptism. Or if one has already done that, Father God, and they, they may have strayed away just a little bit, that they may have the courage to come down as well. And that we as a congregation make them feel welcome and know that we love them so and that we would wrap our arms around their neck and hug them and tell them we love them for their strength and courage to make their proclamation that they are faithful servants of the Almighty God, Father God. Heavenly Father, for the preaching and teaching brethren around the world, we pray that they keep the good fight, that they never never bow down to those who would, who would say otherwise, who would push them away from Christ. We pray, Father God, that your message would be taught far and wide north to south, east to west, Father God, that each and every person will be able to hear your great message of hope and comfort and strength, Heavenly Father. Father God, as we and other congregations around this land prepare to continue on with our services, services this morning, we pray that everything we do here is pleasing unto you. And that's the only thing that matters, Father God, is that everything we do is pleasing unto you. Heavenly Father, we pray that the congregations are safe and healthy and able to continue worshiping you for the rest of eternity or until you come back and claim your throne, Father God. Heavenly Father, we pray and humbly ask that you would be with us, watch over us, guide, guard, protect us, forgive us of our sins, and forgive us where we fail you. In Jesus Christ's great and holy name we pray, and amen. amen. and be ready to sing in just a little while. It's great to be here. It's great to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, appreciate the prayers and the song this morning. They, they were just right for this occasion, and uh, hopefully they have lifted your spirits and uh, caused you to uh, really uh, uh, want to sing and to uh, uh, really thank God for the blessings that you've been blessed with this week. It's uh, just... Uh, it's just uh, wonderful to be at the house of the Lord and to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. There's nothing like it on this earth that we will ever experience as being Christians, being able to worship God. There's nothing like it. If you're a Christian, uh, being at the house of the Lord, being able to worship, being able to sing praises unto God and to uh, uh, study his word. 
And as we find here uh, this morning in our reading, we find some very important things that the Apostle Paul writes here to the Hebrew Christians. At this, at this time when he is writing this, this is about 40 years after Jesus had already passed from this earth and ascended back to heaven. Many Christians have been persecuted, and uh, many of them had lost their lives. Many of them had uh, given their lives in sacrifice for the cause of Christ. But these Jews here, they were scattered out all through the Gentile world. And Paul wrote this to many of them that were still speaking in the Hebrew tongue to remain steadfast in their faith, not to be moved, even though their lives was threatened and... Uh, uh, Many things were being done to them to harm them, to cause them to maybe give up their faith. He tells them not to do that, not to give up their faith, not to stop serving the Lord no matter what happens to them. Never stop serving the Lord. Never give up their faith because this is the most important thing that they will ever have is their faith in God. And he tells them not to give it up not to turn back, not to stop serving the Lord. And as we find in Matthew 6 and 33 where Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And that's what Paul is saying here to these uh, Jewish Christians. He is telling them to keep the faith. Do not give up. Do not stop serving God. Because uh, uh, if we stop serving God or if we give up, we find here we're going to be lost. And uh, many today, even in our time, have stopped serving God. They have not been steadfast. They have not been unmovable. And because of it, many have stopped serving God. Many have not been faithful. Many uh, have given up their faith. But we find here, as Mickey read, uh, there is no escape. There is no escape uh, the judgment of God. And it doesn't matter who it is. No matter when they have lived, he says here, so great a salvation. And he's comparing the salvation of the Israelites to the Christians. And he says our salvation is much greater than theirs. Our salvation is much greater than theirs. And he says here that the Israelites could not escape the judgment of God. We find in 1 Corinthians 10 and 8 where 23,000 fell in one day because of disbelief. They didn't escape the judgment of God. And neither will we escape the judgment of God. And the salvation that is offered us is even greater than was offered the Israelites. They was offered a physical place called Canaan. We're offered a place called heaven. Our salvation is much greater. The rewards are eternal. Theirs were physical. And Paul says here that our salvation is much greater he says also in Philippians 3, 7, and 8, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, for whom I suffered loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So we can see here the Apostle Paul, after he became a Christian, he said all of those worldly things that I thought were so great and so wonderful, he said I consider them to be worthless now, or dung. Dung is... Manure, if you want to know what what the, uh, what it is uh, referenced to, and he says it's worthless. It's worthless those worldly things, those earthly things that uh, we may spend many hours and days and weeks trying to gain. He says here that they're just worthless. And he said any of those things that uh, uh, come between me and Christ, he said. You know, they're worthless. He said, I'm not going to allow those things to separate me from God. And neither can we. I hope I never get to the point in my life that I am afraid to live. You know, a lot of people today are afraid to live. I hope I never get to that point in my life that I am afraid to live, that I'm afraid to serve God. Because when we, are, when we do that, we're allowing our salvation not to be as important as it should be. We're allowing the things of this world to become more important to us than serving the Lord. And this has happened to many people upon this earth. And it's because, as we find in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 and 12, 
He says that we lack the love of the truth. Has that happened to us? That we don't love the truth like we used to? That we don't care about worshiping God like we used to? That we don't care uh, about God in the way that we did years ago? You know, that can happen over a period of time, and Paul is writing to some people that uh, apparently that it had happened to here, that some of them were giving up the faith. They were turning back to the world. They were turning back to the Jewish law system, and he says, don't do that. And neither can we and be faithful in the eyes of God. We have to consider those things of the world. It's not how long you live, but how you live. And when we realize that, we will see what is most important. You know, many people living, in, even in the days of Jesus, we find in John 12 and 43, they believed in Jesus, but they wouldn't confess that they believed because of the positions that they held, the high seats, the positions of authority. They wouldn't confess that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. They knew he was a man of God. They knew he was a great leader and a great teacher, but they wouldn't confess that they believed. They wouldn't confess that he was the son of God because of the positions that they had, because of their friends, because of their relatives, and many today are in the same place. They won't confess Christ because of uh, some of their friends, some of their uh, people at work, some of the uh, positions that they hold. It might affect that. So they won't confess Christ. They won't confess that uh, they are a Christian or they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But we find here the word spoken by uh, the Apostle Paul, the Bible says, was steadfast. It was unmovable. It could not be changed. Yes, the salvation that God offers us today is so much greater. It's so much more wonderful and many times that we and we take it for granted. We take it for granted that uh, that uh, it's not that important. Or after a period of time, we don't uh, we don't love it like we used to. And Jesus said in John 14 and 6, "I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goeth to the Father except by me." So we have to love the truth. And the way that we love the truth is when we really love Jesus with all of our heart. And that is when we're willing to do what his word teaches. And if we're not willing to do that, then we're not, we're not going to be pleasing in his sight. We find where Peter writes in 2 Peter 2, 4 and 6, where it says, If God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to darkness, to remain in that place and to be reserved there until the day of judgment, even the angels that were in heaven that sinned against God... God cast them down. Even the holy angels that sinned against God, God cast them down to a place of torment to remain there until the day of judgment. They didn't escape the judgment of God. They didn't escape the judgment of God. Neither did those in the days of the flood. Neither did those here that uh, we find in 2 Peter 2, 4 through 6 that was there on Sodom and Gomorrah. Nobody escapes the judgment of God. And it tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, it is appointed on the man wants to die, and then cometh the judgment. And it also says that we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that we're all going to make that appointment. This is the reason that we must make sure that we understand there's no escape from the judgment of God. There's no escape. All of these people will face the judgment of God. They may have thought to themselves that I will be able to escape all of this punishment. The people in the days of the flood may have thought that I will be able to escape the flood. The ones at Sodom and Gomorrah may have thought that I'll be able to uh, uh, escape the hell that came from heaven. They may have thought that, but they didn't. Thousands upon thousands has yes, lost their lives that day because they had allowed their first love to slip. They had allowed the, their salvation to slip. You know, these people were saved people. 
They had uh, uh, been baptized. They had confessed the name of Christ. But Paul says here, don't allow your salvation to slip. Don't take it for granted. You know, when we neglect things uh, like a marriage, like a house, like our car, or like anything else, after a while, after so long of neglect, you know, our car begins to rust, our house gets a leak in it, uh, marriages fail because of neglect. You know, our salvation, if we don't take care of our salvation, if we don't put the work in and do what God says, Paul says here that our salvation can slip away. It can drift away. Jesus Christ is supposed to be the anchor of our soul. But if we don't stay close to him, if we don't stay connected to him, you know, after a while, our salvation can begin to slip. We'll allow other things to become more important than our salvation. We'll allow other things to become more important than serving God and having a relationship with God and being close to God in our life. And this is what Paul warned the Hebrew Christians not to allow themselves to get too far away from God. Because when we get too far away from God, bad things happen. Even, our, even those things which we know to do good, we find in the book of James where it tells us very clearly those that know to do good and doeth it not, we find to them it is sin. And what, how does that become sin? It is after a while we know to do those things which are good, whether it be worshiping God on the Lord's day or doing other things. Maybe we see somebody that is in need, and we know that they're in need, but instead of us helping them, we say, well, you know, somebody else will do that. Or if we see somebody or a neighbor that needs a hand, and uh, after a while of neglect, we tell ourselves, well, somebody else will help them. Somebody else will do that, and somebody else will do this. After a while, we get to the point where, you know, we know that we should do that, but no longer does it affect us. Yes, it, it really affected us knowing that we should help to start with, but now it doesn't really, it doesn't really bother us. We know that we should do good, but we don't. We have the opportunity to do good and do right, but we don't. And after a while, it doesn't really affect us whether we do anything or not. That's our conscience. Even though our conscience was trained to help those that are in need, to love our neighbor, to forgive those that, uh, uh, that we know we need to forgive so that we can be forgiven, you know, we get to the point where we just go through life 90 miles an hour, and we just uh, never think about stuff like that after a while. You know, that's what Paul was warning against. He says that our salvation could slip. This is the reason that Peter says in 2 Peter 1 and 10, to give all the diligence to make your calling and your election sure. You know, to make sure that your salvation, that you're holding on to your salvation with both hands, that you do not allow your salvation to slip through your hands. Have you ever done that? Have you ever tried to get a hold of a fish and it just flip and flop and it just goes right through your hands and back in the water? Well, that's happened to me. Plenty of times it's happened to me. You get them in and they start flipping and flopping in the boat and you're trying to get a hold of them and they jump right back in the water. You know, that's the way that our salvation is if we're not careful. Yeah, we may think that we have we may think that we have it hooked, that we may think that we have it in the live well, that there's nothing to worry about, then all of a sudden it flops back in the boat. Yes, we're not nearly as close to God as we need to be. Paul said he warns the Hebrew Christians, don't let your salvation to slip. Make sure you tend to it every day. Make sure you tend to it every day. Make sure you work at it and to uh, uh, make sure that it grows. Don't allow it to uh, 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 
uh, continue at the uh, same pace or the same place, make sure it grows, just like a garden. You know, you go by somebody's house, and me and Kathy will do this every once in a while. We'll see a pretty garden, and we'll say, boy, those people really must work at that garden to keep the, all those weeds out, and their garden is bigger than everybody else. They've got potato vines up to your knees and corn over your head. You know why? They work at it. They put time in. They do what's necessary because they want to reap the fruit from that garden in the fall. What we want to reap, we want to reap from our salvation when it comes harvest time, we want to reap a home in heaven. Well, you're not going to get to heaven by an accident. You're not going to get there just by an accident. You're not just going to bump into Jesus and say, oh, boy, I didn't know if I'd make it or not. I was worried. I was worried about that. Yes. You know, there's a lot of people today that's worried about their salvation, and the reason they're worried about it, it's slipping through their hands. It's slipping right through their hands just like, just like that, and then it's gone. It's gone. You know that's how fast it will. That's how fast it will slip through your fingers. That's the reason that many people go to bed at night worried about whether if they left this life where they would wake up at. You know that's sad. That's sad that people go to sleep like that, and they wake up the next morning instead of doing something about it, they go on eat their breakfast, go on to work, and never think about it again for maybe two or three weeks or a month. And then it crosses their mind again. They know to do good. They know what they need to do, but they do nothing. And after a while, they think about it again. And as time goes on, they think about it less and less. Yes, that's sad, but that happens to many people. That happens to many people in life. Has that happened to us? Has that happened to us as it did with the, the Hebrew Christians who, who were concerned about their life? I mean, they were concerned about being a Christian because they were afraid that they might lose their life by a sword going through their heart being boiled in oil or, or being uh, persecuted in many different ways. They were worried about it because they were living in a Gentile world. They were scattered all out through the Gentile world, through Rome and Corinth and uh, Philadelphia and other places. They were worried that if they spoke up, they might give their life. They might, their life might be taken. Paul says to hold out to the end. Your reward is waiting on you. Your reward is waiting on you. You know, the book, the Acts of the Apostles, is not a book of, of good intentions. You know, a lot of people say, well, I've got good intentions about reading my Bible and praying more and telling others about the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, the book of Acts is not about good intentions. You won't, you won't find nowhere in the Bible of any epistle about good intentions. They're all about acts that men and women did to save their souls and to save the souls of their family. You know, and we have to, too. You know, good intentions is a wonderful thing, but good intentions don't put food on the table. It don't put money in the bank. It don't do any of those things. But a lot of people is full of good intentions, even when they leave this life. You know, many will say, you know, I, I planned all my life to go to church and do what was right. And, and a lot of these people are good morally people. I've talked to a lot of them like that. But the sad thing is, they never done anything. They never done anything about their soul. And their soul is the only thing they're going to take from this life. Many people think today that uh, what was preached to uh, uh, 
Felix there that day when the Apostle Paul preached to Felix, he preached the gospel to him. As we find in Romans 1 and 16 that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. You know, that's what he preached to him. We find in Acts 24 and 25. He preached to him about Jesus. He preached to him about his soul and standing before God in judgment. And the Bible says that Felix trembled at the thought of standing before God in a lost condition. It caused him to tremble. It caused him to shake. He was concerned about his soul. He realized that if he stood before God, he would be lost forever. You know, that caused him to shake. It caused him to tremble. That caused him to be concerned. And he was for a little while. But after that message was preached to him, uh, the apostle Paul went back to prison. Felix went back to sitting on his throne or his rule. And he would call for the apostle Paul from time to time to hear what he had to say. But the Bible says this man was never converted. He allowed that opportunity to be saved to slip through his fingers. He finally got to the point where it didn't bother him any longer. It didn't bother him about being lost. It didn't bother him knowing that there was no escape. You know, this man was a man of authority. He ruled over many people. He punished people for allowing prisoners to escape. He knew, he knew that God was the God that would allow no one to escape. You know, that's how, that's how serious this is. He punished soldiers for allowing prisoners to escape. And many of them would have to give their life if they allowed a prisoner to escape. He should have known. He should have known that the creator of heaven and the earth would make sure that everyone stood before him with no escape. No escape possible. Because God is our creator. And one day we will stand before him and we'll have to give an account of our deeds. As it says in Romans 2 and 6, every man. So we can't allow, we shouldn't ever take a chance on our salvation. We shouldn't allow it to slip. But we need to make sure that we put the time in, that we stay close to God, that we can always see the shore. You know, for many people, it's a fearful thing to be out in the middle of the lake or middle of the ocean and not be able to see the shore. Well, just think how terrible it's going to be not being able to see God. Not being able to see God when we leave this life except when the day of judgment comes and we know we're going to be lost. We know we're going to be lost and we stand before him and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. You know, we never knew God here in this life. But many think because they're morally good, they're going to be able to hear well done. You know, the Bible teaches us time and time again, place and place and place, that that's just not going to happen. Yes, one day, one day we'll have to stand before the great conductor, and that is God. And when we stand before him, uh, will we be able to hear all aboard? Because our ticket is punched? Or will we be like the little boy on the Polar Express? You know, we won't be able to find our ticket. We won't be able to find our ticket because the little boy had a hole in his pocket. If you ever watched the movie, he lost his ticket. That was sad. He was concerned because he didn't think he'd get to go to the North Pole. What about not getting to go to heaven? Not being able to go to heaven when the conductor says, all aboard, we've lost our ticket. We've lost our ticket because we didn't value our salvation. We didn't value our home in heaven. And it slipped through our fingers. 
it slipped through our fingers over time. We got to the point where we were no longer sensitive. We were no longer sensitive to the fact that we were going to stand before God. We became insensitive. We became careless. We neglected our salvation. We neglected our salvation to the point that no longer did we look forward to worshiping God. No longer did we look forward to being in the house of the Lord. You know, that happens to a lot of people. That happens to a lot of people. And that's what, that's what happened to these Hebrew Christians. But he told them not to allow, not to allow their salvation to slip. He goes on to say in verse 4 in Hebrews, the second chapter, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. You know, it was God's will that we all be saved. It was God's will that we all have a home in heaven. And he confirmed all of these things by, by the apostles being able to do all these wonderful works. So there's no escape. There's no escape. There was no escape for the children of Israel that were led by Moses. He said it's even going to be greater because of his son. What about you this morning? Have you allowed your salvation to slip? Have you allowed things to come between you and God, your Father? Have you allowed your place in heaven? Have you allowed your place in heaven to slip through your fingers? Maybe you need to check your pockets this morning and make sure you don't have a hole in your pockets. Maybe you've lost your ticket. You know, we need to be concerned about our salvation. We need to understand that if we don't, if we don't work and pray every day, our salvation can slip through our fingers and then we'd be lost forever. God wouldn't know us. None of us want to hear it apart from me. I never knew you. Yes, that would be that would be sad. But the Bible says that many that day is going to hear that. Is that going to be me or is that going to be you? If that's going to be you this morning, the Bible says you need to come back, confess your faults one to another, pray one for another, one for another, that you can be healed, that you can be restored back to the family of God. We just have to be willing to do what God says. We have to be willing to start over and make things right with God. If we've never done that, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goeth unto the Father but by me. He says, I am the way. And that way is hearing the gospel, believing it with all of our heart, turning from the world, confessing that we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and then being baptized in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of our sins. We find in Colossians 2 and 12 where it says, Buried with him in baptism where you're also risen with him by the faith in the operation of God. When you're baptized, God performs an operation on your heart and makes you whole, makes you pure, makes you clean and white as the snow. If you've never done that, I hope and pray you do it this morning. Before this, before we leave here today, I hope and pray you do that. And if you've done that and you know, you know you won't be able to go where God is at, I hope and pray that you make things right this morning. While we stand and sing the song of invitation. I wonder far away.
is the communion of Christ. Let us bless the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, bless this bread which represents the body of Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, as we break from this bread, let us examine ourselves in a manner that be well pleasing to thee. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
cup which represents the blood of Jesus Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, as we drink from this cup, let us examine ourselves in a manner that be well pleasing to thee. And in Jesus Christ, blessed and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.
On the first day of the week, we are instructed to lay by him in store and let us do so now. Number uh, 43 will be the last song this morning. Number 43, if you want to turn and uh, have that mark and be ready to sing in just a few moments. As always, it's been wonderful to be here. I hope each and every one has enjoyed the service here this morning. As always, if you ever have a question about anything, always feel free to ask and let us know uh, whether you agree or disagree about how we worship, the, the message that was taught. Always let us know and I just want you to know that I'll do my very best to, uh, uh, in a loving, caring manner, talk to you about the Word of God, and uh, uh, if I get rude or uh, arrogant or anything like that, uh, just smack me in the face. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it's never my intention to do something like that, but, uh, you know, sometimes people do things without thinking, and uh, hopefully i would never do that. But... Uh, as always, if you ever have questions, always feel free to ask. I, also, I'm going to do my very best to get a, a, a study together about prayer, how to pray in the morning, how to pray at dinner, how to pray at bedtime, and how to pray uh, when we're out here in the world, uh, at uh, work or in other places, when we just maybe need to take a few moments just to pray. I think it's important enough that that I do this or, or somebody does it as Jesus taught to the disciples how to pray. You know, we need to be taught also how to pray and what to pray for and when to pray and to be a praying people. You know, I put on Facebook this morning, uh, those that don't pray, you know, are, are kind of like the hogs, you know, that, uh, that eat acorns that fall from the tree. You know, they never look up to give God, to give, uh, God thanks. You know, a lot of times, you know, we're the same way. We never stop to give God thanks. And uh, a, a hog will find an acre every once in a while itself. And uh, as Christians, we should be thankful and uh, give God praise and thanks for every blessing that we receive and not to be just like an animal walking around here upon this earth without a conscience. So... Uh, Hopefully, uh, this will be something that will be interesting to you. Hopefully, I can do that here before too long. I think it's, it is something that should be interesting to each and every one of us, as that is that we know how to pray, what to pray for at, at different times in our life, as we go on through our life, that will help us to have a better relationship with God, and we'll have more confidence when we do pray. And uh, hopefully that will be something to be interesting to every one of us that is here this morning because uh, if we're Christians, it should be something that is on our mind at all times is how that I can talk to God and, and I know that he will hear. But uh, if you're visiting with us, 
I just want you to know you're the most special person that is here this morning because you chose to come and worship and uh, uh, be a visitor here at the Chester Ridge Church of Christ. We hope you come back every time you have the opportunity to do so. And as always, uh, as I said before, uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Remember the flare fund, the shelter fund. Also, you can watch these videos sometime uh, after the next day, Monday night, uh, on YouTube or Google. Uh, uh, Hayden and uh, Kyle do a good job in getting these out there, and uh, we're very thankful for that. And uh, uh, so uh, tell others about this, that uh, they can watch these if they can... Uh, uh, have any questions about what we teach, how we worship, and uh, this hopefully will help them have a better understanding of God's Word and how the church worships the true church uh, that we read about in the Bible. So uh, uh, now let's uh, remember all those that are sick, remember to pray for them, be back here Wednesday night. Brother Dale, I think it'll be uh, his turn to teach, and then Brother Philip next Lord's Day morning. I know he'll be ready and raring to go, so... Uh, uh, let's remember that, pray for one another, do all that we can for the cause of Christ. Now, if there is no other words or announcements, we've got the announcements of the gospel meetings on the right back there in the back on the sheet of paper, and uh, they'll probably uh, be sending flyers probably to me this week. They, they usually do, so uh, if they, when they do, I'll put them up. But uh, let's uh, remember that and do all that we can for the cause of Christ. Number 43. First, last verse. More about Jesus.